Thank you. Thank you. I also want to thank you for the best presentation I've ever seen on that particular subject. And I'd like to get a copy of it. So, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm really glad to be here, and I'm glad to see so much interest, and it looks like it's going to be a really good conference. So, uh, I'm going to talk about God's big magnets in the sky, the, the magnetism of Earth, planets, the sun, the moon, the stars, uh, and they all point to a, at least a young solar system and possibly younger stars. So uh, it's going to involve some science, but it's simple science, you know, the sort of stuff you learn mostly in high school or grade school, and uh, just go over what the uh, Maybe a little bit dim in your memory by now. I'll just uh, go go through it step by step. Uh, Judy, are we? How long do I have? How much? One, One hour from now. Okay. So two eighteen. The hook comes out, drags me off. Okay. <laughs> and uh, if I have uh, how much before that do I have for questions? Whatever you want to take. Okay. Well, if I don't get bogged down, we should have at least five minutes for some questions. So you might be storing up your questions and uh, come to the microphone in front, and I'll try to answer them. Okay, now, this is a strange thing right here. Uh, I wanted to know, back when I was working for General Electric Company, uh, I knew about the creationist view that the Earth's magnetic field is young and that it's decaying fast, but we really didn't know at what strength God started the field back at creation. And I was thinking, looking for a way to determine uh, what the strength of the field was right at creation, and then we could date things from the, the decay and the startup strength. So on my lunch breaks, I was spending time in the uh, big factory next to the high voltage lab, and uh, I was looking at the construction of huge uh, power transformers. These are things the size of railroad boxcars and bigger, uh, and uh, electric companies used them. Uh, so anyhow, they used magnetism a lot, and here I am munching away. I'm meditating on a particular uh, degree of a particular verse in the New Testament, uh, and I got this idea about uh, how God might have started up the magnetic field in the cosmos. So, and it involves water, this stuff right here. So, and uh, I'll go into how that works in a moment, but the bottom line is that it explains the magnetic fields of planets, stars, and galaxies. Uh, put a little question mark about galaxies here. I'm not, 100% sure how God made the magnetic fields of the galaxy, but it gives you a number that's close. So, uh, okay. Well, maybe I don't need to explain what the galaxy is just yet. But hydrogen nuclei have magnetic fields. Let's see, my little pointer works. Have you used the number of this thing, do is this top thing? I got it. I don't know if you can see it. Okay, this is high, This is a, a water molecule. Oh, I hit a button. No, I hit that. Computers are the end. Okay, I'm going to use my finger. This is a water molecule. Uh, this is the oxygen atom. These are two hydrogen atoms glued on to the one side of it. And, uh, the uh, blue is the electrons around each set of atoms, and the things inside are the nuclei. So, the, let's, let's say that the green balls are uh, neutrons, and the red balls are protons. Remember what protons were? Maybe not. Okay. Okay. Back to grade school. 
protons or the nuclei of, in the nuclei of atoms and in the hydrogen atom, that they're the only, they're the whole nucleus. And they're little spinning balls of positive electric charge. And when electric charge moves, it makes a magnetic field. So my idea had to do with the electric charge that's spinning on the hydrogen atoms. And uh, so these things make small magnetic fields, and we had measured those in the lab. We know exactly how much field uh, from each nucleus of each hydrogen atom there are. The, uh, these, the oxygen nuclei have magnetic fields also, but they're very tiny because they're paired. They occur in pairs, and they cancel each other out. So you don't get much magnetic field from the oxygen nucleus. The electrons have uh, actually quite a strong magnetic field because they really spin very fast, they're very tiny, and they make a strong magnetic field, but they occur in pairs also, so they cancel each other out. But these hydrogen nuclei, the protons, are pretty independent of everything else. They can point whatever direction they want, and uh, so you don't think of this is being magnetic because its hydrogen nuclei are pointing every which way and they cancel each other out. However, my thought was that if God really wanted a magnetic field, uh, and we'll find that uh, he used a verse, maybe I'll just cite you the verse right now. It's 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 5. So yeah, if you want to look that up. The more modern translations and the Greek say something like this, that uh, the earth was formed out of water and by water. That was the verse I was contemplating when, uh, when I was watching those big power transformers at Denver Electric. And uh, the Greek of that verse is really uh, very, very clear that he took the water somehow and put together pieces of the water to make uh, something else to make a solid earth. So, if he is that determined to make water first and then transform it into something else, which he had to do on the third day, that water turned to uh, solid earth. Uh, if he's going to do that, uh, I thought, well, how much magnetic field would he get if he wants a magnetic field if he created all the water molecules uh, in the mass of the Earth, if he created all those water molecules uh, with all their hydrogen nuclei spinning in the same direction, to say they all point north, uh, then that turns out it makes a, a pretty substantial uh, magnetic field. So the magnetic field depends on the hydrogen nucleus or orientation. So my point is that God formed the earth from created water. And this is that verse I went through. 2 Peter 3, 5. The earth was formed out of water and by water. That was my theory. And I wanted to know how much, uh, how much magnetic field would that generate? Would it be the right amount? So you have to do a little calculation. You look at the mass of the water then you assume that it's pretty much the same as the mass, the amount of material uh, of the Earth now that God conserved matter, conserved mass. So, okay, uh, if, you, if you do that, then you can calculate how many water molecules were in that amount of material. And uh, from the tiny weight of the water molecules divided into the humongous mass of the Earth, uh, you get about two with 50 zeros after molecules. And so then you take all the hydrogen nuclei magnetic fields you know of and multiply it by two with 50 zeros after it, and you get a magnetic field. So if all the hydrogen nuclei were all lined up, you get a large magnetic field, and I'll give you a number. The number is about 8 Gauss, and the Gauss, uh, to calibrate you, you're sitting in the, 
the magnetic field of the Earth right now, and you're experiencing a half of a gauss. You, 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 can you feel it? <laughs> no, you can't. But if you have a compass needle, uh, a compass, its needle will be pointed north by the force from that magnetic field. So just to refresh you, magnetic fields are what make compass needles point north. They have nothing to do with gravity. And they have nothing to do really with the Earth's spin. It just happens that the magnetic axis of the Earth and the Earth's axis are close together, about 11 degrees apart. Anyhow, you've got 7.9 gauss. That's a nice magnetic field. In fact, that turns out to be the right number. Uh, as we will look, we'll see a little while later. So the created field of the water was about uh, 16 times the magnetic field we're in now. So now that condition of lined up magnetic, uh, lined up protons or hydrogen nuclei wouldn't persist but for seconds. So because those molecules, if God just let things run normally, uh, would collide and that each collision disorients the spins. But after each uh, spin is disoriented, there's a law of electric, electricity and magnetism which says that if a, a bit of magnetic current, I'm sorry, electric current would start up in the earth. Uh, laws of electricity and magnetism say that if you have a conductor present, uh, and we would in the core of that ball of water, uh, the, the magnetic field, they try to, the laws try to preserve the magnetic field by starting up the current. So as the electric current uh, starts up, and after all the spins are disoriented, you'll have a large electric current uh, Within seconds, uh, and here is the Earth, and those red lines are magnetic lines of force, uh, and then you have a large electric current rotating from east to west in the interior of that ball of water. And it would be about 250 billion amperes. Right now, the electric current that maintains our magnetic field in the core of the Earth is 6 billion amperes, but then it was 250 billion, if my wacky theory is right. So that field, again, gets preserved when more things happen. So on the third day, God transformed the water to the material of the solid earth, and I think that it was just a flat out miracle, but or at least how he disposed of various energies uh, was miraculous. So he could have he could have taken the constituents of the uh, water molecule and ripped it apart and put it together in different ways to make silicon and iron and all the other things in which uh, the present earth is made. So there's a core right now uh, beneath our feet, about 2,000 miles beneath our feet, and it's made of molten iron mostly, and uh, that's a very good conductor, electric conductor, uh, but the fact that it's iron doesn't mean it's necessarily magnetic because iron at a very high temperature loses all its ordinary magnetization. So if you took the compass needle and heated it up <coughs> several thousand degrees centigrade, it wouldn't be magnetic anymore. But it is a good electrical conductor. So I hope I haven't, you know, given you so many details you're already okay, you're still with me. So there's our electric current again. And the total field stays the same as it was before when it was just water. Okay. So now uh, the current runs down, decays, like a flywheel. So you could picture uh, the electrons in the Earth's core as being sort of like the material of a spinning flywheel. And those electrons encounter electrical resistance 
and they tend to slow, slow down the electric current just like friction would slow down the flywheel. So there's a little simulation, resistance against current. And so I'm going to inflict a graph upon you now, okay? Sorry, I apologize. I know some people are scared to death of graphs. But then those same people are probably even more scared of equations. And if I didn't use a graph, I'd have to inflict it, an equation on it. So this vertical axis is electric current in billions of amperes. And this horizontal axis is time in years from creation to now at 6,000. And I'll show you what happens to the electric current as time goes on. It decreases from 250 billion amperes down to 6 billion amperes. And it decreases with a half-life of 1,100 years. Half-life is how long you'd have to wait for it to decrease by a factor of two. So one half-life, 1,100 years, is down, by, down to a half of what it was. And then uh, another half-life is down to a quarter of what it was, and so on. So it gets down to about 6 billion amperes with a half-life of 1,100 years. Now, uh, for the planets, you're going to need to figure how the half-life depends on their size and mass and everything. So uh, the half-life, this is, you know, it's really an equation, but it doesn't look like one, okay? The half-life depends on the electrical conductivity of the core times the square of its radius. So the bigger the radius, the longer the half-life, which means the field and the current are going to decay slower. So the bigger the planet, the slower the decay. But this is the Earth, with, and that number that we get just from these two numbers of 1,100 years agrees pretty well with what we know about the core and its size. It's right in the right ballpark. So I was happy with that, that theory. I said it worked pretty good. And uh, by the way, we now don't have to just theorize about it. Uh, the Earth's magnetic field, according to measurements, is fading fast. So this is something reflecting the strength of the source of, of the Earth's magnetic field, the strength of the field, the number. And this is the year, 1900 to now, 2000, 2010, as far as I went when I made this. And if you draw a straight line through the points, it corresponds to a half-life of 1117 plus or minus seven years. And then there's a little swiggle there that nobody ever noticed until I plotted it out. Uh, it, but it's there in the data of it in secular literature. And the little swiggle is an effect that I think is sort of the thing sloshing around in the earth. It may be a little bit of sloshing left over from changes that happened uh, about 4,000 years ago uh, in the Genesis flood. But, the squiggle doesn't matter so much as the average slope. So, okay. So I said, okay, the data work out pretty well for the theory, uh, that theory of how it started. Uh, so I said, well, what about the other planets and the sun and the moon? Uh, some of those have been measured, those magnetic fields strengths have been measured. And uh, so I wrote this article for the Creation Research Society Quarterly in December 1984. And uh, it's online at creationresearch.org in their public articles list. So December 1984. And I made some, I said, okay, if I apply my theory to the other planets uh, and the sun and everything, uh, there's some things that hadn't been measured yet at that time. Space probes had not visited the outer planets. And so uh, I made some predictions because a theory is only as good as its experimentally checkable predictions. 
So if you go out on a limb and say, okay, the field should be thus and so and so, thus and such, give numbers, then when the experiment comes along, in this case the space probes, if, if those check out, then you've got a pretty good theory. So, okay, and I'll get to the bottom line of why having a good theory, in this case, is good for this conference. So the planet Uranus, I said, should have a strong field. And the planet further out from it, Neptune, should have a strong field. Uh, the Voyager 2 space probe was underway by that year, but it was several years before it would reach the planet Uranus. And then Mars crust should be magnetized. Nobody had made a measurement then to see whether the crust of the rocks of Mars uh, should be magnetized. Mars doesn't have much of a magnetic field now, and that was fine with my theory. Uh, Mercury's magnetic field, that's the, the planet closest to the sun, Mercury's magnetic field should decay fast because I had a, a figure for its strength at the beginning 6,000 years ago, and so if we should we had one measurement by 1974, uh, which said its field was about 1% of what the Earth's field is. So drawing a line on the graph says it's decaying pretty fast, and in another few decades it should be, uh, you know, 5% or more smaller. And that's a fast decay for any planetary magnetic field. And then it also said that Mercury's crust should have been magnetized because back when most of the rocks were being formed, let's say near creation, uh, there, was, there would have been a much stronger magnetic field than it now has, so that would have magnetized the rocks in the crust. Those were the predictions. And in 1986, two years later, Uranus agrees with the predicted field. There's a picture of Voyager 2 at Uranus, the planet Uranus. And the creation theory said only order of 10 to the 24th, as 10, one with 24 zeros after it, uh, ampere meters squared. You don't need to know that. It's just the number that tells you how strong uh, the source of the field is. Uh, only order of means uh, give or take a factor of three. So Voyager measured uh, three times 10 to the 24th. So it was within the factor of three. Uh, and uh, why couldn't I get more precise in my prediction? Uh, nobody knows how big the core of Uranus is, even today, or what it's made of, so we don't know how productive it was. So I just sort of had to make some guesses. But it turned out that it was a good guess. So the dynamo theory predicted something 100,000 times smaller. And that brings us to the other side, the long ages uh, point of view. Uh, since we have a strong magnetic field now on the Earth, for example, and it should decay, just naturally decay uh, in thousands of years, and we still have a field allegedly after billions of years, then they predicted, or they they, they started seeing a theory that would tell how uh, the Earth's magnetic field would get started and then uh, keep itself maintained for billions of years. Uh, sort of like, an, you know, things would move, in, fluids would move inside the Earth's core or the magnetic field would interact and, and uh, the effect would be like a, an electric generator pumping that current around in the core of the Earth. So, and it was invented first by an Englishman in 1919, 100 years ago, the first theory. It was a real hand-waving theory. Uh, but he said, maybe this is how it works. And so, uh, since he was an Englishman, they call electric generators dynamos. So that's the dynamo theory that you may hear about uh, in other papers and other sources. So the dynamo though, theory predicted a 100,000 times smaller field for Uranus. And the reason was they didn't detect with infrared telescopes much heat coming out of the surface of Uranus and the 
heat is supposed to pump the dynamo and cause fluids to rise and fall. And if there wasn't much heat, there wouldn't be much of a dynamo. So they said, ah, 100,000 times less than. And they didn't know about my prediction at that time. So your this worked out pretty good. You know, I'd say the score was uh, dynamo theorist zero and Humphrey's crazy theory of one. Okay? <laughs> and then uh, 1989, Neptune agrees with the predicted field. There's Voyager 2 at the planet Neptune, the next planet beyond Uranus. And the creation theory again gave on the order of 10 to the 24th ampere meter squared, doesn't matter what the units are, there's a number, okay? And Voyager measured uh, 1.5 times 10 to the 24th, and again, that's within the factor of three in my prediction. So, uh, and that was happy. Now, the other side, after Uranus showed that it did have a strong field, they said, oh, well, since Neptune is almost a sister planet of Uranus, then it too will have a strong field. So they kind of fudged their prediction there, uh, but you know, let's give them credit for it. So now it's, uh, it's Dynamo Theory 1 and Humphrey's Crazy Theory 2. So, so anyhow, uh, you can find some of this by going to icr.org and searching uh, for the article Beyond Neptune that summarizes these two planets. Okay, I hope I'm not losing you because there's a great bottom line to, to this theory being workable and true. So, Mars for us is strongly magnetized. This is something that I really didn't expect they'd be able to do. Because I thought they would have to send astronauts to Mars to dig up some of the crustal rocks and ship them back to Earth and measure how strongly magnetized they were. But it turns out there's this thing called the Mars Global Surveyor uh, Orbiter, and it orbited very close to the surface many, many times. And this is a map. It, it's just like map of the Earth. It's, uh, these are degrees of longitude, 0 up to 360, and these are degrees of latitude. So 0 is the equator of Mars, and this is the South Pole, and this is the North Pole all along there. And the colored bars are the measured crustal magnetic fields. So Mars has have an overall magnetic field. So it's easy to see these tiny little fields popping up uh, underneath the global surveyor. Uh, red is one polarity of the magnetic field, and blue is the other. So near the South Pole, red means that the magnetic field lines of force are coming out of the South Pole. So let's say that was the normal polarity. And then you go a little further north and you see a bar of uh, blue. That's the other polarity, the magnetic lines of force were going into the surface. And there's several of these bars, and they're pretty strong if you're calibrated for this kind of thing. Uh, these are not weak crustal magnetic fields. Uh, the Earth in the ocean floor has magnetic stripes like this, and when they go north and south in the Atlantic, and, uh, and they're about 10 times weaker than these. So when these rocks were formed, uh, two things were happening. One was the, the Mars's magnetic field was rotating, or kind of rotating, reversing fairly rapidly, and at the same time, something was making the rocks cool down below a certain temperature, about 500 degrees centigrade, uh, in succession. You know, there may have been something moving. Uh, it may have been moving, starting on top, cooling down. Capture it. When a rock cools down below this temperature called the Curie point, that's about 500 degrees centigrade, then it locks in the magnetic field that exists at that time and you could tell from its intensity how strong the magnetic field was that formed it, and also you can get its direction. So Mars, when these rocks were once hot and cooling down, probably near the beginning, near the creation, uh, 
had a strong magnetic field. And that's just what my theory says. So it doesn't have a field now, but it had a quite strong magnetic field at the beginning. So you know, I was happy over that. So I didn't have to wait on astronauts to visit Mars. So, so that's the 1984 prediction. Now, uh, more recently, the planet Mercury contrasts the creation of dynamo theories. Uh, this is the second probe that visited Mercury, and it was just recently. The first probe was back in 1974. And so we had two measurements at the time of, of Mercury's field. So before 1974, the dynamo theory said Mercury should have zero magnetic field. So uh, the reason for that is Mercury is a small planet, so it has relatively small core, and it rotates very slowly, only about three times per year. And the dynamo theories need a fast spinning planet. So they said, oh, it couldn't have a a dynamo. So no magnetic field. That's what they predicted. Well, Mariner, that first probe, found that it had a small but significant field, about 1% of that of the Earth. Okay, and then the uh, messenger flew by, just passed by, but didn't orbit it yet, but flew by uh, in 2008. Before 2008, uh, the dynamo theorists were saying, okay, that small field uh, shouldn't be much different because their theory has <coughs> fields very, very slowly over millions and billions of years, or at least hundreds of thousands or so. So in 36 years or so, it shouldn't have mattered that much. So what the program found was that, uh, oh, the creation 5% decay. Messenger found actually a bigger decay, 7.8%. And uh, there's a now I can turn on my theory to say, okay, I would need a little bit of adjustment there. Uh, the 7.8 is quite reasonable, uh, but it was bigger. And that's a fantastically fast decay for uh, uh, any planet's magnetic field. So then, uh, with the same space probe, swooped by a couple of times and then finally settled into a tight orbit around Mercury. And uh, the dynamo theory before that happened was saying, well, Mercury always had this weak magnetic field. It's just rotating so slowly. And, you know, their theory is not anything that gives you know, really accurate predictions. They just sort of have to wave their hands. So, uh, in fact, there have been a lot of different versions of the theory trying to make it work since 1919, and, and it's still in pretty bad shape. So, uh, the dynamo is saying, it, you know, whatever field it has now, must have, it must have had for billions of years. But the creation theory would say, no, the field would have been much stronger in the past because it didn't decay rapidly. And so uh, in the past, it would have a strong magnetic field. So in 2012, Messenger assumed this tight orbit swooping low over the northern plains uh, of Mercury, and they found crustal magnetic field, strong, strongly magnetized rock, just like in Mars case. So uh, Mercury actually had a strong past field, much stronger. And then, uh, just for uh, one extra, the field of the crustal rocks recorded was opposite the direction of Mercury's field now. So Mercury's field has reversed its direction at least once. That's kind of interesting, but um, it didn't, you know, I didn't predict predict anything like that. So, but all of the theories, 1984 predictions are now fulfilled. Uranus strong field, Neptune strong field, Mars strong crust magnetization. Mercury's field decays fast. Mercury's crust is magnetized. Uh, so I was very happy uh, after that. And uh, you know, theorists don't usually have the, this much fun. So. <laughs> Now, uh, the last uh, 
decade or two, uh, moons and asteroids and meteorites also agree with the theory. This is uh, uh, this is the uh, what is the name of that? It's the Galileo probe. It's right there on the screen, and it's in the foreground. It's passing by the volcanic moon of Jupiter called the Io, and there is big Jupiter in the background, and uh, they measure magnetic fields of some of Jupiter's moons, and uh, the only one that has uh, magnetic field of its own is Ganymede. It has a strong field and uh, it fits the theory. Uh, asteroids, uh, two of them were visited by probes called Castra and Braille and they were strongly magnetized and they fit uh, pretty good. The meteorites that fell to Earth were formed when they were hot, when they were formed, were magnetized in fields comparable to um, magnetic field of the Earth today. So uh, that's, that's quite reasonable too. So uh, the Sun has a magnetic field. And uh, when I first did it, uh, it agreed okay with the theory, but the Sun changes its field every 11 years, going from one polarity in one direction to the other. So I'm going to walk you through a bit of what they know from measurements that the field near the surface of the sun does. So it's these red things are magnetic field lines, and then there's differential rotation. The equator goes west faster than higher latitudes. And the, the sun is a very hot conducting, electrically conducted gas, and it carries the magnetic field lines of force along with it. So if you have the middle, the equator moving fast and, uh, and the upper latitude is moving slower, you're going to have a bend in the line. And uh, so I'll show you that. See, the time has passed about five years to get to this. And they actually measure these uh, twisted lines of force starting to wrap themselves like a, around the sun like a ball of twine. And uh, as they get tired and tired, the rapid gets stronger and stronger. Over here, you've got sunspots popping up in pairs along the twisted line, very caught, stretched magnetic lines of force. That's what causes the sunspots. So this from here to here is about 11 years. And at the same time, the overall field has been diminishing in strength, getting smaller and smaller, and then at 11 years it actually has reverse, reverses itself, and the ball of twine starts un unwrapping itself. And after another 11 years, you get back to the quiet sun with no sunspots and a nice, smooth, regular-looking magnetic field. But the strength, that's called the sunspot minimum, and the last sunspot minimum had a, a field that was easy to, to read um, because it wasn't very complicated. Uh, and it was about 80% of the strength of what my theory says the creative field should be. So that amounts to a loss of electrical energy of about 0.15% per sunspot cycle. So these, the sunspot cycle does all this reversing and squashing around and twisting up. It uses up the energy. But uh, it's actually a pretty efficient cycle to cycle and it hasn't used up much of the creative field according to my theory. Okay, now here's the bottom line, the thing you should carry away with you. These solar system data fit the theory only with biblical conditions. The smaller bodies need six to 10,000 years to work at all. If it's much older than that, the theory couldn't work. And then, the planets and the sun must start as water. Uh, for, the reason for that is that if it's other stuff, like silicon, oxygen, calcium, iron, their nuclei have too little magnetic field to be any good. You need hydrogen nuclei. So, okay, the sun is mostly hydrogen, so we should be fine, right? It 
except that the sun has, uh, would have too much field, more, you know, about 10 times more than what it has if it started as pure hydrogen. But if it started with, as water and then got converted it to hydrogen, uh, then everything's fine. So two biblical conditions, the time and the composition of the initial stuff. If you started with sawdust, it wouldn't work very well. So anyhow, uh, that's the bottom line. So we have a theory. It's been confirmed by uh, confirmation of predictions. And the theory requires the solar system to be young and constructed of the original material that God seems to have done for the planets as well as the Earth. Okay. Now the stars, all apparently all have magnetic fields, and this is uh, some of the stars. Uh, the Earth's magnetic field is one gauss, roughly. Ordinary stars like the sun, about 10 gauss, those fit the theory. Magnetic stars have about 1,000 gauss, so I think I understand how that happened, consistent with the theory. Uh, white dwarfs are much smaller than they, it looks like they, uh, the water collapsed, or the, the bodies collapsed to something much smaller. So uh, white dwarf stars, and they have uh, measured fields of about 10 million gauss, and that's consistent with the theory. Pulsars, you may have heard of those, they have a trillion gauss, and they're really collapsed down, they're, they're called neutron stars, really tiny, and that that field has been compressed down to a much smaller volume, and that raises the strength of the field. And the pulsars have about a trillion gauss field. They measure that too. And magnetars are a strange BC, which have about a hundred times more than pulsars. And nobody knows much about how magnetar works, but that's probably the most intense magnetic field in the universe, about a hundred trillion times what the Earth's magnetic field is here. So, now all of these seem to fit the creation theory pretty well. Now galaxies have magnetic fields, and this is a magnetic, uh, this is a, if you can see, there are little tiny arrows here. Those are the measured magnetic fields, and they tend to follow the spiral arms of galaxies. So just to refresh you, a galaxy is an island of about you know, several hundred trillion stars are the Earth's Milky Way that we're in uh, is our own home galaxy. And it's about 100,000 light years across, and the nearest neighbor galaxy we can see in this hemisphere is the one in Andromeda, about two million light years away. So these are big. These are big. So and they have magnetic fields, and. Uh, the measured fields, they can look at this uh, spectrographic data in both fields, have about one to ten millionths of a gauss, and the lines follow the spiral arms, and they can fit the creation theory. However, I don't know now exactly how God made the galaxies from balls of water. So uh, there's several processes they could have used. And, uh, so this is a little bit iffy. Now there's a new book that's not so new anymore. It's about, uh, well, let's see, five or six years old, called Earth's Mysterious Magnetism and That of Other Celestial Orbs. And I'm one of the authors. And the guy who really made it readable is my friend, the engineer, uh, Mark Despain. Uh, he took all my technical papers and all my beloved equations, threw out the equations, and <laughs> compressed them down. And you know, he made a book that's quite readable. Uh, I'd say it's at the college level, but you could be a, a, a liberal arts major in college and still find it uh, quite understandable. Or maybe a smart teenager, uh, you know, one of like science, one of the science geeks. Uh, so this is a good book. And uh, you can get it at creationresearch.org uh, in print, uh, and also three different ebook versions. The ebook versions are cheaper. Uh, creation. I'm sorry. Creation.
Etsy.com uh, or Amazon.com has one of the ebook versions. Earth's Mysterious Metaphysical by this madman named Humphreys. So, how are we doing for time? 16 minutes. Oh, wow. Okay. We've got time. So here's the bottom line. Magnetic fields show God's handiwork in the heavens. Magnetic fields, again, of planets, moons, asteroids, meteorites, sun, stars, pulsars, bank stars, and maybe even uh, galaxies and the cosmos itself. Maybe the whole cosmos has a bit of overall magnetic field. We haven't measured it yet. So, I'm happy to be finished this soon because you can ask me all the questions you want for maybe 10 minutes and we'll reserve maybe five more minutes for a little break. When, when do we have this break? Uh, we don't have, we don't have just a short break and then that break is going to be up, but if you want to take some questions, that's great. We don't have a walk? We don't have a long break between the doctor and the So how long can that break be? Or okay. should that Yeah, so if you want to take some questions, uh, we can take about so, 10 minutes for questions. 10 minutes for questions, 5 please, minutes for questions. Please break. come over to the mic if you have a question or a recording and we'd like to get the questions captured. So I'd really be happy please for come you up to here ask me your questions. There are a friend here. Please, I, I need all the friends I could get. So. Um, you also made a prediction for uh, Earth reversal during the time of a lot of cooling. Could you just talk about that? Yeah, I don't know if that microphone is working very well. He yeah. just much taller than the microphone. Can I repeat? Or uh, I'll repeat what you said. So, uh, yes, I did make a prediction. He asked about a prediction I made about reversals in 1986 at the first International Conference on Creationism. Uh, I had a theory for how reversals would happen. And there in that book that I just showed you, uh, one later chapter sort of goes blow by blow with pictures of how the field would reverse itself and reverse itself pretty rapidly. So uh, according to the data we have, the Earth's magnetic field reversed itself very rapidly during the one year that all the geologic layers were being laid down. So a hundred times per year, that's once every few days, that's pretty fast. And I said, well, if we look at a, a lava layer that's fairly thin, let's say about one yard thick or so, the outer edges of it should cool down pretty rapidly. And uh, so the outer edge would record the field one day, and then sometime moving in toward the center, the inner part cools down a few days later and should record a reverse field. And they have found evidence of that. Uh, it was highly controversial within the field of uh, paleomagnetism, but it was found by two experts who were highly, highly respected in the field, and they found several instances of this in one location. So uh, they, they captured. So the cooling lava flows captured uh, very fast reversing field uh, happening near the end of the flood. So, uh, near the top part of the geologic column. So, yes, sir. Okay, I'm kind of assuming that uh, before the flood there was a, a canopy of water surrounding the earth. And I'm not sure that's really valid, but that's my assumption. And if that's true, why didn't that have more of an effect? Or did it have an effect the magnetic field. on the magnetic field and why and why not? <laughs> well, first of all, if there were a canopy, it wouldn't affect the magnetic field much because uh, you know water at ordinary temperatures or water vapor or liquid water uh, doesn't have much electrical conductivity and uh, so it wouldn't grab the magnetic field and change it. However, uh, if you've read Humphrey's book uh, called Starlight and Time back in 1984. There's an appendix that goes through, no, I'm sorry, yes, appendix B goes through, um, it's partly upon the evidence and the biblical evidence and the scientific evidence for a canopy, and I didn't find any. So uh, I and most other uh, physical scientists. Uh, Theorists, but not all, uh, no longer believe there was a canopy. You can do the same thing with a whole lot more carbon dioxide, for which we have evidence, and uh, a stronger magnetic 
to attempt it here. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Dr. Henry Morris was the originator mainly of the chemistry theory. He was very attached to it, but he knew that I had, uh, you know, sort of not, not endorsed his theory, uh, but he still uh, uh, approved of me being hired at the Institute for Research. <laughs> you know, he believed in academic freedom as long as we didn't get into questioning the biblical foundations. So uh, I'm very grateful to him for that. So he was very fine guy. So, you mentioned the uh, current of the Earth was 250 billion years uh, of creation and 6 billion now. Yes. Is there a point where life could not exist if it dropped below a certain number? Okay. Uh, well, is there a point at which the life could not exist if the magnetic field dropped below a certain amount? Uh, I don't think so. I think. Uh, the magnetic field is really not as important as some uh, creationist lore uh, implies it is. Uh, uh, Dr. Thomas Barnes wrote the first thing about the decay of the Earth's magnetic field, and he sort of implied that uh, if the Earth's field went away, bad things would happen, and other evolutionists think that bad things would happen. And if, if the Earth were hundreds of millions of years old, that might be so, but on a short time scale, it didn't happen. Uh, and, uh, so, um, if the magnetic field went away, we would hardly notice a few bacteria that use it to navigate, we would notice a few birds that use it uh, otherwise, and if anybody still uses compasses to na navigate, then we could do that. So, otherwise, we'd be fine. Okay, you mentioned Star Line at the time, and I, I read that years ago, and I was really fascinated. Um, and then later on, I read this uh, Dr. John Hartnett's theory where, where he expanded Carbon Carbonate's cosmology and stuff, and I kind of like the whole idea of dark matter, dark energy, kind of the events of things kind of going away and stuff. Is, what I was wondering is, are they like just completely different theories, or is there like a possible harmonization between them? There is some common ground between uh, Dr. Hartman's theories and mine. In fact, uh, his first one was pretty much like my second one. So I, I have two cosmologies, and I'm working on the third now. And the reason is that all of us cosmologists uh, in the creation circles have not looked very closely at what happened on the first three days. And it looks like that is very important to figuring out what happened on the fourth day. So that, that, that's what I'm working on. So you're asking, is there some common ground? Yes, uh, there's common ground. But really, the information we have from the cosmos is too sketchy to really nail down which theory would be right. We'll take one more question. One more question. I was wondering how this would affect the Ice Age theory because if I, I sorry, I was wondering how this would affect the Ice Age theory because if water has the magnet magnetization, would the Ice Age mess with Earth's magnet magnetization because it would have been mostly covered with ice, which is just a simple Okay. So you've heard that uh, well water only has is magnetized only under very special circumstances, mainly having just been created that way. But uh, after a few seconds, that water gets demagnetized, and other things have to maintain the magnetic field. So the ice in the ice age wouldn't have any effect. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Humphries. Let's get back.